say we're saved by grace alone. And that's not true either. God's grace is demonstrated in what he did for us through his son. That's God's grace. God says, you need help. He says, I am going to prepare that help. I'm going to allow my son to come to earth and die on a cross for each one of you. That is God's grace. That's God's grace demonstrated. So whatever we do is as a response to understanding the importance of that grace. Titus uh, 2 verse 11 says, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. Stop with Jesus. The grace of God has appeared. God has stepped into humanity in order to show us how to live, to give an example of how to deal with people, and ultimately to have to be able to die with hope and confidence because Jesus conquered death. And if we put our trust in him, we too will conquer death. But there's also that ramification, other ramifications of that. Remember, saved by the blood of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 talks about. Right? For Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first born from the dead, the highest of all the earthly kings, he loves us and has washed away our sins with his blood. The Hebrew writer says, without the sacrifice without blood, the shedding of blood, there could be no forgiveness of sins. So the fact of Jesus dying on the cross, shedding his blood for us, that gives us the opportunity of accepting that salvation that God has revealed through his Son. And it's through the blood of Jesus that our sins are washed away. And that's a good thing to remember as we move on further on. Because there's a link further on with that. What is the message of the gospel that we preach? It's the grace of God demonstrated in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. A lot of people think the gospel is what we do. The gospel is our believing. The gospel is our confession. The gospel is our being buried with Christ in baptism. That's the gospel. But that's not the gospel. That's man's response to the gospel. That's our response to the gospel. The gospel is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And Paul puts it in a beautiful way. And as he reminds the Corinthians about the resurrection, the very fact of the resurrection that they were questioning by that time. He said, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you which you received and by which you stand, by which you are also saved. You're saved by the gospel. If you hold fast, if you keep a hold of that which has been revealed, which Paul preached to them, unless you believe in faith, unless you're wasting your time, if you hold fast to the Lord, I preach to you, unless you believe in faith, for I deliver to you, first of all, which I also received, Christ die for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried and he rose again in the third day according to the scriptures. God had foretold it all. God had foretold how one man could come back into a relationship with himself. Jesus fulfilled that. And these people who are struggling with the idea of will we, will we live again after death? Is there such a thing as a resurrection? Paul says you're founded on the reality of the resurrection of Christ. That's the gospel. That's the good news that God has given you. That you can, if you put your trust in him, you too will have a resurrection from the dead in the last day. He goes on to say, we are saved by the gospel. Romans 1.16, he says, I see no reason to be ashamed of the gospel. Why? It is God's power for the salvation of everyone who has faith. The Jews fast and the Greeks also. In the first century, many Jews who gave their lives to Christ. But after that uh, a initial, in, 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 uh, initial impetus of the gospel, uh, in chapter 10 of Acts, we see the gospel begin to go into the Gentiles also. We are Gentiles, they're non Jews, that includes you and me. These people gave their lives to Jesus in the way that Jesus had commanded them to do or commanded them to do. And they, Jews first, and then the Greeks, all became followers of Jesus. They became Christians by doing what the gospel required of them to do, or what the gospel challenged them to do. We need to respond to the gospel of God's loving grace. How? By accessing the blood of Jesus. How do we access the blood of Jesus is a key question. And, and it's a, 
And the scriptures will be dealing with us and answer to that question. How do we access the blood of Jesus? We are saved by preaching. The Paul again says in 1 Corinthians 1 18. He says, The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He says, We recognize that we, we are trust in Jesus, that we can have salvation. But the world out there looks at us and thinks we're not cases. How on earth can we say by somebody's blood, somebody who died 2,000 years ago? How can we how can we rectify our lives, change our lives, be different by trusting in this supposed Jesus who been around 2,000 years ago? That's stupid, that's foolishness. But to us, who accept the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, that's the power of God at work. That's the power of God at work. Salvation through Jesus Christ. But we've got to hear the gospel. That's why time after time, Son of God's day after Lord's day, you hear somebody say, we need to preach the word. We need to be sharing the good news that we have. Why? Because people have got to hear it. But in our day and age, people are bombarded with so many things. They can't hear everything. That means our voice is going to be that much stronger to help people understand. Jesus did live. Jesus did die. Jesus was resurrected. He brings us hope and salvation through his blood that was shed so long ago. And so people need to hear that message. We have the message. That's why we're sitting here today. Somebody told us about Jesus. And so we have to take that opportunity then to continue and share that with other people. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now there are people, I don't know whether any of you ever uh, come across that channel called the God Channel. There are people who will tell you, you cannot have faith. You cannot have faith unless God gives you directly faith. Well, 2,000 years ago, Paul was writing to the Romans, he said no. He says faith comes by hearing. Also on the God Channel, you'll have some people tell you, there's nothing you can do to save yourselves. There's nothing you can do to save yourselves. Does that mean that God is going to do a healing for you? Or is healing something you can do? Healing is something you've got to do. And I'm not going to go into the brief here, but some of the terms we're going to use here, you're going to see an interesting pattern. Because healing is in the Greek an active word. Later on, we're going to talk about another word, baptism. And that's a passive word. And a lot of people we talk to, as soon as we mention baptism, say, it's a work, it's a work, it's a work. Well, healing is something you do. Healing is a work. But it's not a work to merit your salvation. It's not a work to earn your salvation. It's a work in response of something that God has asked us to do. He's asked us to hear, listen to the message, and then move on. So faith comes by hearing. And how do we get that message? What message are we hear? It's the word of God that we're supposed to hear. And that's the message. We are saved by the word. Saved by the word. How can the word save us? Because when we hear it, when we're obedient to what it has to say, then that's part of the salvation process. We can be saved by hearing there is a man called Jesus. He did die 2,000 years ago. He was raised from the dead 2,000 years ago. The word tells us that. It's a revealed word. Christianity is a revealed religion. God has spoken. God has told us what the real situation is. And Paul, writing to uh, not Luke, writing in Acts, says, who will talk to Cornelius, he says, Peter will tell you the words. He will tell you the words by which you and all your household can be saved. And that's, if you go further reading down through the text, he said, but Peter does. Peter talks to, to uh, Cornelius, his household, and they are obedient to what they hear. We're saved by God's grace, okay? Ephesians 2 verse 5 says, even when we were dead in our sins, he brought us to life with Christ. It is through grace that we are saved. When we are sinners, as far as spirituality is concerned, as far as God is concerned, sin is 
been a gulf between us and God. We are dead spiritually. And to be able to be brought alive spiritually, we must have be born again. And we're born again by this, what you're going to see here today. Our commitment to Jesus, our acceptance of, of Jesus on his terms, not on our terms, not the stuff that we make up, but that he is revealed in Scripture. And so we're saved by grace, because Jesus died that we might have the opportunity of salvation. That's how we're saved, by grace. We're saved by faith. Faith comes by hearing. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. A faith in Jesus, sorry. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Jesus said that we were still alive. This is actually one of the last things he says to his apostles as he went to send them off into all the world. The other one, Matthew chapter 28, says the same thing, it's slightly different manner, a different manner, but it says the same basic, basic principle. Luke also talks about it, again, at the last chapter in Luke, in a slightly different way. But it's, the message is all the same. The message is, if we believe that which we've heard in the Word of God, it will enable us to understand what God wants us to do to accept the grace that he has to offer through Jesus Christ. And if we reject that, he says we're going to stay sinners. We're still going to be unbelievers. We're saved by repentance. Repentance is a really good word. It's the idea of turning back to God. And it's interesting, much as in that earlier verse that we read, that God loved us and allowed Christ to die for us while we were still sinners who were dead in our sins. Okay? He allowed Jesus to die, but we were walking away from God. He allowed Jesus to die, but we didn't care about God. We were, he was allowing Jesus to die to take our place, but we didn't want to know anything about salvation. And yet, because we now realize what Jesus has done, we are prepared to listen to him. And we're willing to turn away from our old way of thinking, our old way of life, our old attitudes that usually quite often circulate around me and mine and what I want and what th things uh, are important to me and turn back to listen to God because <coughs> he, knows, he knows what's best for us. And therefore we turn back to listen to him and to follow his instructions and to live the life that he wants us uh, to be willing to live. So Paul writing, he's writing to that very distinct and very elite people. He's talking about all those uh, around the altars of the underworld of the gods on, on that, uh, that plateau. And, and he turns around and says, there's a, a message here for an, an unknown God. You think you missed a God out just in case he's a, a, a God of retribution. I'm going to tell you about the God that you missed out. And he's far greater than any of these other idols that you're putting across there. But his near the end of the message is, truly he says, Times of ignorance, God overlooked. But now it demands all men everywhere to repent, to turn away from this ignorance. Okay, you're worshipping a stone? Okay, ask your stone to do something for you. Ask your stone to tell you something. You're worshipping a piece of wood? He says, somebody went down in the wood, okay, Isaiah said, somebody went down in the forest and they cut a tree down and they cut it in half. And they took one half and they boiled the fire and made a nice little fire out of it. And the other half they carved it. And then they stuck it up somewhere and they said, Oh, bow down to the God. And they asked this God, God, can I go out and kill my next door neighbor? And that God says, Oh, that's a good idea, I'll do that. He says, That God will tell you to do anything you want to do because you are actually motivating the God. You're, you're telling the God what you want to do. And he's sitting there not doing a thing because you can't speak to you, you can't do anything for you. And then you go out and do what you like. He says, I'm telling you about a God that's different. A God who has revealed himself. A God who challenges you every day of the week to be a different kind of person. I think it was young, but it could have been a little I think it was young that said, it is a little I feel like dead. Uh, God is of a man's own invention. But the reality is, all the way through the Bible, if he's a man of his own invention, I wouldn't like my God to tell me what to do. All the way through the Bible, God says, I wouldn't do that if I was you. That's your dire consequences. 
I wouldn't do that. So it's not man's invention. If no man would invent it, God kept telling you, don't do that. You need to live differently and challenge you to live differently. So that's the reality of, of behind that. He commands all men everywhere to turn away from that kind of thinking, to turn back to God. We're saved by confession. That means you speak. Again, I'm going back to that phrase before, there's nothing you can do. Do you mean that God is going to do the talking for you? God's going to do the confession? If I, I miss out that one in repentance, isn't that? God's going to turn for you? No. It's something that you do. It's challenging you to turn. And it's challenging you to, to confess that you believe with your mouth. That the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Jesus is the key to our salvation. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the key to our salvation. And unless we're prepared to believe that, and unless we're prepared to confess that we believe that openly, he says, it's not going to work. But if you do confess, we are prepared to confess Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you will be saved. All right? So we're saved by baptism. Uh, Peter, like he says, there's an anti-type. That means there's a type that no one has thought. There's an anti-type which saves you. Namely, baptism. He says, when you're buried with Christ in baptism, he says, you're not having a bath. You're not taking down there with a, a bar of soap and giving yourself a good scrub down and thinking that's going to take away your sins. It's happening on the inside. It's not the water that is ending to you. It's your actual obedience to what's God. Remember Naaman, the, the, the uh, Syrian? commander who had leprosy and this little servant somebody tells him, if you go down and see this prophet of God, he can take your leprosy away. And, and the poor old neighbor, he, he loads up his uh, donkeys, his horses with gold and all sorts of stuff to pay the prophet for his services. He gets down there and the prophet doesn't get out of the door. He sends his servant says, tell Naaman, tell Naaman to wash seven times in the Jordan. And the poor old guy goes to Naaman and says, could wash seven times in the Jordan. And then he, he was mad. He, he, what? The guy won't even come out to me. He won't even see me. He's telling me to go wash. We've got far better nights and rivers back home. And he's asking me to uh, uh, wash in the Jordan. What's, what's going on? And the person says, look, you know, ask, if he'd asked you to climb a mountain, you would have done it. If he asked you to kill a thousand people, you would have done it. He's only asking you to be dipped seven times in the waters of the Jordan. And David, okay, okay. And he goes there. Now you, you imagine this situation. This guy is a commander. He rules. He's a, he's a, he's a good commander, so he's pretty high up. And there's everybody around him is looking up to him, okay? And they all see him go down into this water. And he comes up into the water the first time. And guess what? He's still alive. He looks at all the people watching him and he thinks this is absolutely crazy. But seven times, okay. The second time he comes back up. The third time he comes back up. The fourth time he comes back up. The sixth, is he getting mad? Is he getting, what's in that? I'm looking stupid here. I'm looking absolutely crazy here. And maybe somebody said, just one more time. And he went down that seventh time. And when he came up, his leprosy was gone. Why? Because he had done what God, through the prophet, had asked him to do. He didn't decide, well, if I go down to the Jordan, if I dip myself a couple of times, I'll come up out of the water. I'll be fine. No, he didn't make the rules. God made the rules. And so when God said, dip, seven times, Naaman eventually, gradually, dip seven times. But when he did that seven times, Take my plea. We're saved by being justified. Romans 8, 33 says, Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It's God that justifies. Much more than having been justified with blood, who shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. God is the one who justifies us when we have done what he's asked us to do. He cleanses us from sin. He accepts us as not guilty. We're saved by being sanctified. This is where they get the word saint from. And every one of you, believe it or not, is a saint. Paul was writing to dead people when he said, I'm writing the saints up. He's writing to you and me, people who are saints of God. We're 
I say by the abandoning of thanks to God always, brethren, and loved by God. God from the beginning <coughs> chose you for salvation through sanctification, cleansing, being made holy out by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Belief in the truth, accepting the truth, applying the truth to our lives. Then we will be cleansed. So we see there are many things in the scriptures that save us. If we truly believe the scripture has been the word of God, the truth has been revealed once for all time. Through Christ Jesus, God has given us the privilege and authority to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them. And they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. All rights, the beginning of Romans and the end of Romans. Now this is surely how we today, by following and doing exactly the same thing as in the first century, that's how we ought to respond to the grace of God, the gospel of God today. We don't join the fact, I've had people say, I'm going to join the church. It's not, a, it's not a country club. It's not a, a tennis club. You can't join the church. Yeah, it's just almost like, can you choose from your brothers and sisters? You couldn't choose the family you were born into. God adds you to his family, his called out people. You come into a loving relationship with God through accessing the blood of Jesus, through our faithful obedience to his commands. Matthew 28, 19, 20. Jesus, this is it, what Matt, Matt, the Matt, uh, Mark one. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and make the uh, in the relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you at the end of the age. Peter said, This is the follow up. Jesus died, he ascended into heaven, and Peter, taking the information from what we just read, this is the very first time that Peter proclaimed the gospel. He says, Repent every one of you, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of it, so your sins can be taken away. And God will give you the indwelling, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2 41, surprise, surprise, they accepted what Peter said. And they were baptized that very day. 3,000 were added, not joined, added to the body of Christ. That day. This is how we ought to put our lives to Jesus. We are saved and forgiven at the point of our baptism, which gives us access to the blood of Jesus. And then at that point, we also receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Colossians is a good passage. It says, In him we are also circumcised by the circumcision made with our hands by putting off the sins of the body of the flesh. Being buried with him in baptism, which you also were raised with him through faith in the work of God, who raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your trespasses, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all sins. This is an interesting question. It's an important question. At what point are our sins forgiven? Is it when we hear the gospel? Is it when we believe in the gospel? Is it when we repent of our sins and are willing to turn back to us, God? Is it when we are prepared to confess and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Or is it when we are buried with Christ in baptism to rise to walk in union to life? At that point, in our baptism, we are saved. At that point, our sins are forgiven. At that point, we receive the indwelling Holy Spirit. At that point, we are born again, saved by God's grace through the blood of Jesus. In uh, the whole book of Acts, which is a history book in the church in the first century, you have lots of people who gave their lives to Christ. And in, if you look at this, when you put them all together, there's lots of bits missed out. But the bits that are missed out imply the bits that we read elsewhere. So it says they heard the gospel, they believed the gospel, they repented of their sins, they confessed, and they were buried with Christ in baptism. That's what the people in the first century did. That's how they became Christians. And that's how we become Christians today. We're born again into a new and living hope. Uh, at our baptism, we are placed into Christ. We are associated with the death of Christ. We have the forgiveness of our sins. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we are raised to walk in life. Remember Romans 6, verse 4? We are raised to walk in a new life. Peter said, Repent and let everybody be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the forgiveness of our sins. Why? You will then receive the gift, uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have all sinned, all made the wrong choices. We have all, in time past, lost our relationship with God. We all need to be reconciled, brought back into that relationship with the Father. God has done for us in Jesus what we could not do for ourselves. Through 
death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, God paid the price for our sin. God offers hope for tomorrow. And if we'll accept the sacrifice of Jesus on his terms, not maybe up our own way of salvation, then we commit our lives to Jesus by accepting the offer of salvation in God's terms. We have been born again, bought by the precious blood of Jesus. God paid for us with the precious life blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Through Christ we have come to trust in God, and because God raised him from the dead and gave him great glory, our faith and hope can be placed confidently in God. We are challenged to walk in a new way of life, with new attitudes, new actions. We are challenged to grow and display the fruit of the Spirit. Why? Because all who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified self with all its passions and desires. From now on, we're saying, not my way, your way be done. May we learn that use every opportunity to share the good news of God's grace revealed from the death and resurrection of Jesus. May God continually bless, encourage, and enable us, and we do his goodwill to live to his praise and glory.